at the University of Medical Sciences, Emergency Medicine. It's my honor to be here to introduce today's presentation. As we all know, COVID-19 pandemic has been a significant shift in everybody's life all over the world. And we as physicians have played a significant role in controlling this pandemic. And all we have heard about in the last five months is about how to diagnose, prevent, and treat these patients. Today, we'll be looking into different modalities that have been used at present for the early diagnosis of COVID patients, their interpretation, their efficacy, and their use in distinguishing heart and cardiac diseases and lung diseases. Um, thank you again for being here, for taking time out. Um, we'll be running a question and answer live session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please feel free to pop all your questions in the chat option and they'll be answered to at the end of the session. And if you miss anything, please don't worry because the recorded uh, webinar will be available to you shortly. And uh, once again, I would like to thank Tehran University of Medical Sciences for supporting this webinar today. Without further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Shahram Hariri. Dr. Hariri is a practicing physician, internationally recognized expert in emergency medicine. He serves as assistant professor at the emergency department in Tehran University of Medical Sciences. He's also an active researcher and has presented at many scientific national and international meetings. If one takes a closer look at Dr. Hariri's alchemy, many qualities pop up such as hard work, goodwill, and perseverance. Dr. Hairi, could you please join us? And uh, could you please update us about the several modalities present uh, for diagnosing patients with COVID-19? Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Hairi, an emergency physician. I'm working at one of the designated hospitals for COVID-19 patients since February 20th, we have visited, admitted, and discharged a huge number of COVID-19 patients with my proudful colleagues in Tehran. Uh, one of the main issues we were faced and we are going to discuss today is how to choose imaging modality for COVID-19 patients in different clinical situations. Understanding the strength and weakness of these various techniques it is vital for every doctor who is ordering them. Why we need a chest imaging for COVID-19 patients? Well, we know that imaging is an integral part of the practice in respiratory medicine. Chest imaging can help us finding and confirming the lung involvement in the course of disease. It shows us other condition accompanied or superimposed in thoracic cavity which can get the situation worsened, especially when they are manageable in emergency room with simple and fast life-saving procedure like putting a chest tube or a catheter in. Ultimately, it shows us the extent of the lung involvement and there is a possibility we may gener generate severity score method in relation to prognostic factor to justify and match the level of care at presentation to ER. Uh, let me just share some of my... Sorry for the delay. Well, uh... During the uprise of this epidemic, we saw majority of patients visited in the emergency department or designated walk-in clinic and mild to, with mild to moderate lower respiratory symptoms. And they are seeking not only medication, but also crystal clear requests for some tests. They are constantly questioning medical uh, personnel and staff about the test because it's important for them and their family to know if they're fully infected with COVID-19 and how bad were the extent of their disease. On the other side of this conflict, doctors need a confirmation 
of the disease or a piece of evidence that shows a footprint of the virus in the patient's body in order to prescribe medication, especially when there is a con not a confirmed safe remedy for it. Shortage of COVID-19 PCR tests was an irrefutable around the world. Most hospitals protocols insist on keeping RT-PCR tests only for admitted patients. Then the doctors start requesting chest CT scan not only for inpatient management, but also for outpatient treatment to confirm the disease mostly. Considering the amount of cost, transfer, and exposure risks impact on patient management, some of those chest CT scan were not necessary and could be replaced by other diagnostic modalities. You can see both CDC and ACR recommendation here. They both discourage confirming the COVID-19 disease by X-ray or CD scan. Now let's talk about the suitable imaging technique. Well, in my opinion, it should be acceptably sensitive and specific. It should be simply operated at the point of care, not only reveals the extent of the lung involvement, but also shows other structure and their involvement within the chest cavity. If it shows some prognostic factor in relation with final outcome, that will be perfect. Let's focus on the device itself. How can we describe a perfect imaging device or machine in such a situation? Portability should be considered as an important factor during epidemic. Considering weight, size, and power source of these machines, some may seem impossible to move around. Patient, personnel, and public safety should always be considered in requesting imaging modality. There is, there, these risks are related to patient transfer exposure contamination and radiation. Justifying the risk of transmitting a high-risk COVID-19 patient from ER to ICU radiology units and the risk of contamination to this area puts some weight on portability of these devices. Um, disinfecting protocols also will reduce the pace of imaging center and maintain complexity and expert personal requirement also play key roles in medical imaging center, which sometimes provoke limitation to these situations. Introducing handheld ultrasound device run on a rechargeable battery for hours which are almost absolutely portable and they are packed with user-friendly imaging application are game changer in this extreme situation. There are tons of published, published evidence that ultrasound done by physician at point of care has accuracy and reliability and might be considered best practice in such a situation. We as a recommend we as a community, uh, community of experts, we have to take a look, a hard look, because care not based on evidence may not always be a good care. And how do we integrate the need to do systematic investigation to know what actually is beneficial versus no or potentially harmful technique is paramount important. In conclusion, I recommend incorporating multi-centric research on a scope of point of care ultrasound on lung and heart in COVID-19 to find good evidence for screening, diagnosing, and monitoring the management and foreseeing the outcome. Whenever we want to order imaging for a patient, double check with yourself. Why do you need that imaging? Is there a good evidence to do so? Are you following hospital or national guidelines? Is that imaging changes your management? Is it safe? Is there an alternative? Today, other panel members will discuss much about 
these imaging modalities in screening, diagnosing, and management of COVID-19 patients. Thank you very much for your attention and time. I wish you best luck fighting coronavirus in all over the park. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hariri. Um, as Dr. Hariri uh, just stated, viral testing remains as the most specific method for diagnosing COVID, but we have several uh, modalities at present that have been used by all physicians all over the world, like chest X-rays, CT scans, and uh, point of care ultrasonography that has helped to diagnose COVID-19 patients. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sherwin Farahman. Dr. Farahman is one of the emergency medicine specialists who assumed responsibility for developing this discipline in Iran and was one of the members of the first Iranian Society of Emergency Medicine. Dr. Farahman's career has taken him through 20 years of study, research, training, and administration. Dr. Farman is currently the head and associate professor of emergency medicine at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Dr. Farman, with chest X-ray as one of the most frequent modalities used in emergency medicine, emergency department, can you please brief us about the abnormal findings we expect to see in the chest X-ray of COVID patients? Mm, hello, good evening or good morning. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Harry, for informative introduce uh, about uh, imaging modality to diagnose COVID. Uh, in first session, I try to explain more about the role of uh, plain chest X-ray to diagnose COVID. Um, when uh, we are talking about uh, imaging modality to diagnose COVID, maybe approximately all of us think about CT scan. And it is obvious because chest X-ray is a less sensitive modality in comparison with CT scan. Uh, according to research, uh, a reported baseline chest X-ray sensitivity is less than 70%, is around 69%. And uh, what about the specificity? Uh, really, I couldn't find any reliable report, but according to some studies, chest radiographs may be normal in early phase of disease or in mild cases. And according to, the, to a study uh, uh, which has been conducted in Hong Kong, uh, among four uh, patients uh, with documented and confirmed COVID disease, exactly 20% didn't have any abnormalities on chest radiograph at any point during the course of the disease. And it is very important that chest X-ray not sensitive and not uh, specific for to diagnose uh, COVID. But why we use chest X-ray? Uh, to clarif clarify the reason, I rely on the recommendation uh, of American College of Radiology. The main issue for them, uh, as Dr. Harry said, is uh, contamination and, uh, and uh, transporting of infection and virus to other patients. Uh, infection control issue related to the patient transport to CT scan suites is very important and uh, may be dangerous for other patients or even for personal of CT scan rooms. And the contamination process uh, for CT scan units is inefficient and time consuming. And because of that, during a pandemic or, or epidemic uh, like uh, our situation, maybe uh, these time consuming process for decontamination of suites uh, uh, disrupt radiologic service availability. Another main obstacle to use CT scan to screen all patients who are suspicious uh, to COVID is lack of CT scan availability. For example, in my country or other part of the world, um, in uh, suburb area, rural area, or in further uh, provinces, there is an access to CT scan. And because of that, when we decide to screen all uh, suspicious cases uh, with CT scan, it is not possible. And the uh, two other main uh, obstacle to use CT scan is cost and radiation. And uh, when we consider all of them, According to the recommendation of American College of Radiology, maybe 
uh, we can use portable, portable chest radiography and this modality may minimize the risk of uh, cross infection. What is the first step? And we have to uh, confirm uh, the diagnosis with other modalities. But uh, what we can find uh, in a chest X-ray of a patient with suspicious to, who is suspicious to COVID, um, one of the most common findings is interstitial changes, as you see in the um, uh, in the figure. Um, this finding is not specific for uh, COVID and uh, any kind of interstitial pneumonia with uh, viral or bacterial origin uh, can mimic this presentation. It is not specific for COVID. Another common finding, uh, which is common in CT scan again, is ground glass densities or opacities. But so we confirmed the CT scan of a patient in the uh, right side uh, with the chest x uh, of that patient, uh, we realized that interpreting the ground glass densities in chest X-ray is not as easy as CT scan. It's obvious and it's more difficult in comparison with CT scan to interpret. Uh, another uh, common finding in chest X-ray is bilateral lower lobes consolidation. Uh, Consolidation is not common in CT scan, but uh, one of the most common findings in chest X-ray. Uh, and finally, uh, other findings uh, which are not uh, common like previous ones uh, are peripheral airspace opacities or diffuse airspace disease. Finally, I want to conclude that plain chest X-ray X -ray isn't sensitive and actually isn't as specific to screen and confirm the diagnosis of COVID. And, uh, but uh, because of the decontamination, decontamination issues, cross infection, availability of CT scan, cost and radiation, um, maybe uh, uh, it's not logical to use CT scan for every person, every suspicious cases. And uh, in comparison with chest X-ray, we have to uh, compare the cost and benefit uh, of the usage of uh, CT scan. And according to some recommendation, in the first step, as a first modality to study uh, for a patient, we can use chest X-ray. But we have to confirm our diagnosis in other in next steps with uh, other modalities less, like chest CT scan. And we have to confirm the disease by, for example, uh, other diagnostic modality like RT-PCR. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farhman, for your brief and comprehensive explanation. Uh, I would like to remind our participants once more that there will be a live question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So please feel free to ask all your questions in the group chat section. One of the most available modalities that has helped every physician all over the world is uh, in diagnosing various life-threatening condition is bedside ultrasonography. It's my privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Hamid Shukuhi. Dr. Shukuhi is an academic emergency physician who completed his residency and fellowship in emergency ultrasound at George Washington University in Washington, DC, and is now serving as the director of the emergency ultrasound fellowship program and assistant and associate professor of emergency medicine at Harvard University. And, um, Dr. Shukui, thank you for joining us. Could you please demonstrate and explain about how to use point of care ultrasound sonography in patients with COVID-19? Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for uh, participating. Um, it's an honor to be here and thanks uh, to our university for inviting and helping to uh, be part of this important uh, session. Um, to answer your question, I'm going to just focus on the actual findings to the uh, COVID-19. You might think this is maybe a kind of late presentation as the we pass the actually the opt up if the um, like uh, uh, COVID-19. But I can assure you, as you already know, this is not going to go away that fast, and it's going to actually make the our work in the emergency department and in uh, in the ICU is more difficult in near future because we are not actually following this as a prime suspect anymore. 
what I'm going to talk today, I'm going to just talk, outline some of these actual um, uh, finding related to the um, ultrasound that we can find. We can define how that to use this ultrasound as part of the of the diagnostic algorithm that we can actually like, uh, including the CT scan and X-ray, how to compare these two, and how we can use this to. Um, um, I think we lost Dr. Shukuhi. Dr. Shukuhi, can you yell me? I can hear you, but I can, unfortunately, the, my slide has been uh, locked if uh -huh. screen is locked. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Shukui. But I don't have the keynote. Uh... I'm opening again to hopefully this. Thank no. you. My slide is not going forward. Is that uh, the same experience you have? Oh, yes, we are just stuck on the slide which says objective. Objective, no. Yeah. Can uh, somebody help us? Uh... Dr. Shukui, if you don't go to the full screen, can you just uh, share your slides in this mode? Like, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to do that. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, my, uh, as I said, this my screen is uh, completely. Uh -huh. Can I unshare and um, start over? I think, uh, yes, Dr. Shukui, I think you should unshare and start I over. I did, and uh, if. Uh, uh, if it's okay, we'll go to the next presenter. Yeah, I uh, think it's going now. And we'll get back to you. I think it's it, working now. It's working now? Great, yeah. thank you. Is this, you guys have this uh, next slide? Let's see. Bainas, do you have this slide uh, with diagnostic? No, I don't have your slides yet, Dr. Shukui. We have your slides now, Dr. Shukuhi. Okay. Yes, that's what Okay. Is this working now? Yes, it's working, Dr. Shukuhi. Okay. Well, I apologize for uh, this uh, technical difficulty. So we ultrasound, we are actually using for multiple uh, reasons. The main reason that uh, they mentioned earlier was the diagnostic one. To use this uh, actually ultrasound for um, uh, diagnose COVID. 
is this uh, right now maybe that's not is too late because we have a lot of testing that faster and easier we can actually get the result. Now the question is, is this the way that actually risk is stratified these cases with the COVID? Or you can actually use it for disease monitoring for the ICU cases if you can just see what the response to therapy is. And the, the next application obviously is the application to limit the exposure of the people and providers by using the high end uh, technology that actually you can visualize and get the faster actually like access or like nerve block or the um, central venous access. So all of you remember, this is not ultrasound or CT or X-ray per se can answer your questions. This is the integrated lung and cardiac ultrasound. You cannot just look at the lung and decide if this patient can be treated the way that actually treated in different way of the COVID. So it's very important to actually keep these, uh, the cardiac as well. I, have the, I want to share with you, this is all the uh, possibility of the cases that they are coming with respiratory distress or um, dyspnea. As you guys can all see different options in here, pneumonia, pleural sliding for the pneumothorax, looking for the RV dysfunction, looking for DVT and the um, LV function basically. And on the top of all this thing right now, we have the corona, then COVID-19 that actually is coming and is not going to go away. And you can see it's merging with all different modality that we have. This is all the uncertainty. This is not just a shape. All you can see, this is all the curves of the uncertainty for the diagnosis that you can see in this uh, uh, nice diagram. So for just to give you two examples, this is one case of the COVID case that you can see, I'm going to explain deta in detail the lung part very soon. But as we are looking at the heart, you guys seen more and more of these cases these days. This patient has RV dysfunction and actually has pulmonary embolism on the top of the COVID-19 finding. Another case, this is a 34 years old IV drug abuser that with the fever and the O2 saturation of 80% in the era of the COVID-19, by any deficient the, the definition, this patient is gonna to go to the respiratory emergency and is gonna be Consider for the COVID, obviously, the young, but he's homeless and he's actually IV drug user. You guys look at these along and you see multiple B line, you see that actually IVC also is not really super dilated. You can still see that some kind of collapsibility. As soon as you look at the heart, you see this picture. This picture is the, to the right side, you see the apical four chamber of the heart with the significant dilation of RV with the significant the vegetation on the top of the actually uh, the thoracospid valve. And all you can see in the left side, that's not really personal lung. All you see is the right ventricle and left ventricle, the left, uh, I'm sorry, right ventricle and the right atrium that's feeling uh, the whole picture of the heart in the personal lung axis. So be careful that they don't have that the entity of the unknown COVID-19 anymore. Any case that you are seeing these days, is going to be considered suspected COVID. That's the, so the next question was, is this the one we want to do for like a CT scan for the, for the chest x -ray? Which one is the best to start? There is no best answer. Majority of this all finding is to use in different situation and different setting. If you have this, some, the only access you have is to have a portable x-ray, that is the best test. If all you have is the portable ultrasound, that is the best test. This is a pandemic, but we are adopting all this modality and all different technique locally. And it all depends for the resources or comfort level and actually look prioritizing resources. One idea that is coming up with this all the imaging is the actual triaging resources. This all in a pandemic and uh, in all disaster, that's one of the most important function of any kind of imaging that we are using. We are using this one to decide which one of this patient is going to get ICU bed. That's not about diagnostic anymore. You are triaging your ICU bed based on that imaging that you are getting. 
In terms of diagnostic, as you can see here, CT is not recommended as the first line of the tree, the diagnosis for COVID-19. This is the March 11, 2020 by ACR, American College of Radiology. They all ask the CT need to be reserved only for hospitalized patients for those the clinical indication is clear. And obviously to lay the clear for um, like uh, infection control. So let's talk about a little bit of ultrasound finding of the actual COVID. What we have for the long ultrasound finding of COVID, I just tried to categorize it that actually you, may, hopefully we can actually understand what we are talking about, but it's really hard to put this in any of those cells that you can see here. I try to see if we can say some of them, they are really typical, some of them atypical. Some of them, if we see, we say inconsistent. It means we, this is not COVID. It's not supposed to be. And sometimes it, it indeterminate, we cannot decide. Early uh, time coming, the patient has a few B lines, we have no idea, the patient has no fever, the rest of the stuff is negative, and it's too early to decide it, so indeterminate. So let's look at this all. For all those four categories that I said, <coughs> I have in the COVID-19, we have three level of involvement. One is the pro itself. From the, I'm just talking, I'm not talking about the pathology. I'm just uh, talking about the involvement means uh, um, the pictures that we can see, the pattern of the ultrasound can be see. So one is the pro involvement that is gonna uh, show in different shapes. Interstitial involvement that is gonna see in different way and consolidation. This is a three category of findings that we are seeing in different level. On the pro involvement, the first thing we see is we see irregular pro line. Sometimes we can see a little bit of pretty pro edema, but no um, pro fusion. Interstitial involvement actually is going to be based on the uh, that stage of the disease can present with the discrete B lines, can just move towards the confluent B lines and just completely be a waterfall or just like a uh, white lung that we are all familiar with that term from the CT and X-ray. In terms of consolidation, as I said, based on the stage of the disease, you can see the subpural consolidation, lower consolidation, and uh, maybe even airborne program, that's very unlikely. But some people, they try to just put that subpural consolidation as part of the pro, but it doesn't matter where you categorize it. It's important to see in all these three categories of the finding, we should find uh, some uh, picture. So in terms of the typical, those are the ones that we are talking about. Irregular proron, I mean, I'm trying not to use the term thicken because this is not a thickening basically. From pathophysiology, this is not a thickening of, this is the reverberation and this is the actual change of the picture, is not the thickening of the pro, so I try to avoid that term and not use it. Subpro sub consolidation, these are the ones that everybody's seen and say, oh, that's COVID, that's done. When you see and you say that's done, it means it's the most common finding that you are seeing it as more typical, but because it doesn't mean this characteristic is typical that it's just more likely to be actual COVID. Interstitial edema, if having just anything related to plural but no B lines is very unlikely. And uh, most important to say, the majority of this finding is come for posterior. If you are seeing a scanning, then you see everything in front and nothing in posterior part, and you are not having pitfall in terms of the technique. So that's part, it could be atypical. Let's look at some of the images of irregular proline that we are talking about, as you can see to the left side. So the proline is supposed to be smooth, it should be fresh, com completely flat line, but you can see, uh, I heard uh, Dr. Um, uh, Charlie mentioned the bumpy, that's yeah, that could be a bumpy one. And to the right side, you can see um, there's a little bit of localized actual uh, edema around the pearl that uh, you can see it. Irregular proline, more picture of this one. And sometimes you want to see the pro line with the, um, like, oh, maybe that's breaking the pro line. That's correct. That breaking pro line, we call that actually like for subpro consolidation. If you have doubt, this is a subpro consolidation. 
This is the way you can do it. If you use the M mode on that, you can clearly see, see that very nice break into that plural line that you guys seen it in this picture. Multifocal B lines is the next finding, as I said, as the representing interstitial edema, interstitial involvement, I'm sorry not to say edema, interstitial involvement, as you can see, uh, in different level, um, we look for the B line. This B line, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time because this is very operator and the technique dependent how to find it and uh, how to categorize it. You can see here, all of a sudden, some changes for this patient you can see there's a little bit of a sub plural consolidation. You can see a bunch of B lines that is coming from that uh, almost plural line. And this one is another sample of it. You guys see this all the comet tail or B lines that is coming down from the actual uh, plural line and all the way to the edge of the image. And you have that sub plural. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fart. Did you guys have my voice? Yes. A typical ultrasound finding that we see that, that we say probably less likely to be that actually COVID-19 is predominant A-line, something that we see in COPD and like asthma, alveolar B-line. This is a new term that I'm just uh, um, introducing here to explain it a little bit more. And the uh, focal regional hepatinization. These are all the three that you can see. You see that to the left upper corner, the A profile one, this is the all A line. This is very unlikely to have it unless you are just scanning this anterior part of the chest. You're looking at the right side, hepatization is not only hepat, this is what I'm talking about only hepatization, nothing else. That's very unlikely, that's a lower pneumonia. And at the bottom of this uh, screen, you see two pictures. I put one interstitial, one alveolar. This is important distinction. The ones that is coming from the heart failure and the ones that are coming with the pro, uh, with the pro, uh, pro fusion, those are to the right side of the screen that you can see alveolar picture. Those are the pro line is more smooth. And the, uh, the picture of the actual B line is different. I know it's hard and I do not try to really distinguish these two by any means, it's tough and it's Maybe that's a little bit too early for this to talk, but be mindful of this finding. This is the, uh, the picture of the, uh, the pro line for somebody that has actually like the alveolar B lines. This is a case that you can see the heart, obviously you can see the heart is not functioning. You see the significant profusion as a result of CHF. And look at this image uh, of the actual B lines in the CHF. This is the picture. This is not the same picture we are seeing with the COVID B lines. So to put them next to each other, so COVID-19 and CHF, which one B line is, everybody agreed this is the COVID. I, ho I hope that I could hear you all and you could say to the left of the screen, those are the COVID. And to the right of the screen, you can see that the actual pro line that you can see pretty smooth and you see the two picture of the B lines is a bit different. So B line optimization is very important. Do you, I cannot ask you personally, but I can say these are the four picture of one patient. But at the first glance, you could say these are from different people. All we are changing here is the depth and the way that actually we are checking for the B line. The first one is the too much depth and you miss a bunch of the B lines, you don't see it. You decrease the depth and you can see actually, you see a bunch of B lines, perfect. And to the left lower corner of the screen, you can see actually a longer, a wider picture of the plural line. That is one of the things that I'm just wanna ask you guys to do instead of just doing the <sighs> north-south probe direction, 
Sometimes you can fit the probe between the ribs and see a longer and it's a wider picture of the pearl line and pick some of the B line. This is not about numbering how many of the B lines you can see between two ribs. So, but this is one way you can see. And if your patient is, the body habitus is allow you, you can see that actually using the linear probe still is can give you the same picture of the B-lines you have. We used to say for the B-line, we always need to have a phase array or curved linear, curved probe to see it because we need to have depth. It does not matter that how depth deep it is. It's matter that actual B-line reaching to edge regardless of how much you increase that depth. So it's not about that you show 15 differently. If you are having 10 centimeters, so it means you don't see it. But I want to see if you have 10 centimeters, I want to see is the all 10 centimeters covered, not just the line that is started from the pearl line and is actually like traveling two centimeters. This is a study that actually we did in here and we are going to publish very soon is the B line optimization. If you can see, this is all the picture of one patient. This is the picture of one zone, one picture of the somebody that we actually tried to see in the uh, vertical column, you see the depth. We changed the depth from six, 12, 18, 24 centimeter. We changed the gain from 10%, 50 and 90. And you guys see how that affect the B line in this picture. So this is the one that 1218, you can see the, all the green part. The greenest one is the most important one that you can, you want to see the best picture of the actual B line. And you see the about 12 centimeter and about 50% gain is the best place to start with. So this one was about the typical one. Let's just talk a little bit about inconsistent one. The one we say, say, no, 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 that's not COVID. If you reach a point and say, no, that's not COVID because you are not expecting to see that one. So this is probably inconsistent. One is the large profusion. Two is a dynamic airborne program. And the not having B lines and lung sliding is another one. Hepatization, I tried to, I hesitated to put this in here or is a typical. We normally don't see only hepatization. I can say if you only see hepatization is less likely. If you see a patronization with other finding, <coughs> you can think about that as a part of the actual COVID. I just put some of those example. This is the case that is very, 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 very unlikely to be COVID. This is the case is very unlikely to be COVID. You see the dynamic Gabriel program in here with the patronization, and this is the patronization that you guys see in this picture. I hope everybody familiar with these pictures, but, um, and I'm not confusing you. So these are all in the same case, one case all put together, and you can see this is not the case of that. So looking at the ultrasound where we talked about this all typical, atypical, and consistent. So is this a way that actually we match this with the CT scan? Yeah, they tried. We know some of them is probably to work next with together, like, they mentioned thick and poor here. Yes, this is the term we are using and we are hearing a lot more. We see tons of B lines, different levels. So maybe that's representing ground glass uh, shadow, uh, confluent B line, maybe that's a uh, pulmonary infiltrate that we are seeing it. Subfluid consolidation, we name it the same in CT and ultrasound. And multi, multi lower distribution of this, the actually the fact for the COVID is the same. The reason you have multifocal is being is because this the virus is very contagious. The first place that is going to be con, uh, the is going to be transferred is the is the neighborhood. It means if you have an only unilateral finding, is very 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 unlikely because the second lung is the first to be infected before your neighbor in the street to be infected. So. Next, I want to talk about, I'm sorry if I'm just expending, spending a lot of time, but I'm just uh, trying to minimize and have two sessions in one session. So risk stratification, if you're using this one for risk stratification, is that possible or not? If you can see this picture, they try to really say, oh, the value of different finding, including that actually thickened pro line 
and the consolidation, they are different. I agree from personal experience, but this agreement, it doesn't mean that that doesn't make it right because there is no data, there is no the, um, study to show it yet that actually like the confluent B line is necessarily is show the more severity. Severity we defined because of the outcome. If the outcome is not changing, severity is meaningless. I have this picture, you have that picture. So which one of us, the question is, if that picture is linked to that some finding, some outcome, that's meaningful. So to just talk about this plural, they all try to say that's the early COVID only all you see the thick and plural. And then we go a little bit more, you see the more of the confluent B line and you see the most severe one that actually you see some plural in terms of plural only. So gradient staging, we ourselves are working with the two teams of the researcher that uh, Dr. Harry is one of them. And we all seen in here say, if we can actually do this gradient and the staging, all the staging means that in the different stage of the disease, if the patient is started first week, first two days, we scan them, or second week, we scan them, is there any different? And this finding, they showing distribution in all different uh, zones. And we say, we try to use one of this one and score them. Say, probably maybe if you are seeing this consolidation, probably compared to the thick and plural, this is the score three. The other one is score one. And this is the one that's come from this new, not a study, it's a consensus um, uh, expert opinion that you can see here, score zero is all air, score one is the thick and plural, score, score two, <clears throat> you guys see this uh, subfluoric consolidation and the score uh, three, you can see this uh, bulge of uh, consolidation. And based on that, this is all the result that you can see, I'm not gonna go, in detail, but this is the two studies that has been done in Tehran, and I'm so proud of this team that actually really uh, took the lead, and um, actually this is one of the uh, studies that they try to really find uh, if ultrasound can find the outcome, and including this one that you can see, they try to link this all different finding to the, the worst uh, outcome that is the patient death that you can see here, and you all can just by looking here, uh, heat map, you can see that actually that some of the finding is uh, standing out uh, in terms of like uh, predicting this. So uh, this uh, ultrasound is, do you think this is actually really matched with the um, clinical picture? Absolutely not. Majority of these cases we have, you guys have million example can tell me right now that actually this, we have this picture of the horrible like this one, this is the day seven, the patient is back to work and still you have this all multiple B line just like almost waterfall. This patient is a seven days, it's completely healthy, it's going back. Look at this picture, day two, day four, day seven, it's almost the same. And patient is actually started, first day is the worst day and then actually seven days, all good. Another picture of the patient that you can see is the day two, day four, and day um, seven again, I think, that day six that has the actually a little bit better because it has much of a line. Part of it is not about ultrasound. Part of it is the nature of the disease. As you can see here from this picture, we have multiple phase and stage of the involvement. Stage one, early infection that we see nothing. Stage two, this is pulmonary phase that you can see that this is the time that we started all talk we had. After this, this patient is still in the ICU, this patient is sick, this patient still has a regular uh, proline, this patient has the, but is in a stage three, or maybe actually at home. So the same thing, you have this stage two, you identify all this finding, this patient has a, uh, like less severe disease than going home or going to the ICU. Both of them continue having the same problem. So protocol we use, I am not recommending any specific one. Unfortunately, the majority of this all come still based on no science, based on no data. So everybody tried to say it. Now you can see here, this is all medicine team. They all tried to find it. All they said, so instead of starting in front, go to back. As you can see, just this is the format they want to scan this one. Impossible. 
this is all really hard, this is a tough, and I don't believe that is, we are adding value. If we know there's a lot of this thing is adding value, we do it. This is another one, the jump, that this is the one I showed you earlier about the scoring system. As you can see, the posterior one, they started six zones for that posterior. The barely you can just put your probe anywhere. We are using ourselves, this is the one we actually, for, for a study, we are using this. This is the two, four, six, uh, 10 zones. Still, it doesn't matter. I am still not saying this is the best way to go. A lot of these cases, we are actually really scan anterior. We go to the right. This is a for research. For research, you need to show that actually anybody else want to do it and they can, should be able to replicate your work. But it does not mean clinically you need exactly follow this one to be accurate. A lot of this finding, you find it in the first uh, scan that you do and you do So scanning is not free, risk-free anymore. Be careful. As you guys can see here, this is our team and uh, the team in Tehran University, Iran University, as you can see, they are very well prepared when they are actually scanning this patient. Do not minimize PPE. PPE is necessary for all these cases. So summary, I want to say that ultrasound, respiratory distress, and hypotension is just is the best way to look for it. COVID is one of the best way to look, not just for diagnosis, for the monitoring, for risk stratification, and to know what to do next. Send this patient home, send this patient to the floor, or send this patient to the ICU. I start this patient for the treatment, or do not start this patient treatment. Typical COVID finding, we discuss about the plural irregularity, multi-B, uh, focal B lines, and subplural consolidation. And with the saying that, I want to just show you this one last image, and thank you for letting me to participate. This is all you can see on the bottom part of the image. This is us in the ER. We are looking with the AD ultrasound, looking for lion. And radiology CT, just that detail of the small and large elephant, you can easily see. So I saying that, I thank you very, very much for letting me to be part of this uh, interesting and important educational session. Thank you. Because of the four, Bara. do you have my voice? Yes, yes that's the data. Uh, as we discussed today, because of the four specificity and sensitivity of chest X rays, chest CT has been the most used tools ever since we got to know COVID 19. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Farman once again and would like to ask him to kindly explain about the abnormal findings we expect to see in the chest CT of COVID-19 patients. Sorry, do you hear me? Excuse me, do you hear my voice? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, in first step, uh, and one of the main questions is, uh, is the CTS scan a good screening tool tool for uh, COVID-19 or not. Uh, according to a systematic review and meta-analysis of diagnostic accuracy of chest CT scan to detect COVID-19, uh, the main result is the sensitivity of chest CT scan for COVID-19 was great in, greater, uh, great in, especially in Wuhan uh, area, but varied among other regions. Uh, in Wuhan area, the reported sensitivity is between 90-16 to 90-80 percent, 96 to 98 percent. And the sensitivity was available in all the studies 
ranging from 69% to 99%. And uh, about the range of speci uh, specificities, uh, the range of reported specificities is between 25% to uh, 56%. Uh, why there is a difference between reported sensitivities? Maybe the main reason uh, behind the difference of uh, reported sensitivities is heterogeneity of, uh, of the experience of radiologists. Uh, all of us uh, know that uh, in the first step of, step of epidemics, we, are, we weren't uh, familiar with uh, common finding of CT scan of these patients. And because of that, interpretation of CT scan was so hard. And in the area with lower level of severity and lower number of patients, maybe uh, there is a accepted level of experience among uh, physicians, especially radiologists, and maybe uh, it can affect the result of uh, report the sensitivities. But uh, it is important that in the context of emergency disease control, the sensitivity was more important than a specificity. And another point that um, uh, actually, in, uh, in some study, uh, which uh, report uh, a specificity of chest CT scan, the result of the RT-PCR work of significant number of sus suspected patients, according to the CT scan, turned from negative to positive. And we are talking about uh, specificity. Uh, we are talking about the false uh, positive cases and compare the result of CT scan with the result of RT-PCR. And we have to remember that the sensitivity of RT-PCR around uh, 50 to 70% or 80% according to different study because it's related to the type of kids, uh, sampling and et cetera. Because of that, maybe some false positive cases uh, are really the true positive cases. And maybe the specificity of CTS can underestimate uh, among different studies. But uh, when uh, we decide to uh, talk about emergency disease control, the sensitivity is very important. Um, another important is que question is, uh, is the CT finding correlated to the severity of disease? The answer again is yes the severity is possibly related to chest CT scan finding. For example, uh, growth of ground glass opacities um, to other type, for example, crazy cabin opacities or expansion of calcification, all of them are good indicators uh, for uh, progression of disease. And otherwise, maybe by resolving uh, the parenchymal involvement, um, indicate the improvement of disease. For example, in one study, 42% of patients have had improved CT scan before negative RT-PCR result, and it's very important. Because of that, we can use some severity score system, for example, in one of them, we can uh, consider uh, a scoring system uh, from zero to five for uh, each of five lobes of line. And for example, when uh, the percentage of involvement, uh, involvement is less than 5%, consider a score, one a score between five to 25 percent involvement, two a score uh, between 26 to 49 percent involvement, uh, three a score and between 15 to 75 percent of involvement, uh, four a score. And finally, when the uh, percentage of involvement of a lobe is more than 75 percent, we can consider five a score. And by calculating total numbers of five lobes, we can uh, considering a, a score between zero to 25, and uh, it can be useful to uh, estimate the severity of disease, the percentage of uh, uh, involvement of parenchymal, uh, line parenchyma, and finally, we can monitor patient uh, to improve or progress uh, in the course of the disease. But uh, what the common CT scan finding? As you know, and uh, we are familiar with the uh, common uh, CT scan finding of COVID, uh, ground glass opacity, especially multifocal bilateral ground glass opacities in, uh, which are located in lower lobes is the common CT scan finding of this patient. It is, uh, as I said before, it's very familiar for us during this uh, epidemic. Uh, 
Other common findings, uh, finding is crazy craving and is a sort of indicator for progression of disease. And uh, it is thickening of interlobal and intralobal lines in combination with ground glass opacity. As you see uh, in this picture uh, with uh, yellow arrows. Um, another common finding is vascular dilation. A typical finding in the area of ground glass uh, is widening of vessels in this area. And again, you can see in this picture, uh, dilatation of uh, vessels in ground glass area is one of uh, is another common finding in CT scan of this patient. And uh, maybe uh, in later stages of the uh, disease, uh, we can see tra uh, traction uh, bronchiectasia. Uh, and at the um, end of disease, at the resolving of uh, parenchymal involvement, sometimes uh, there is architectural distortion and uh, formation of subparallel bands. These findings are most common findings of CT scan of COVID patients. But uh, again, I want to emphasize that we have to remember that consolidation, pleural effusion, and especially unilateral, unifocal, or diffuse uh, parenchymal uh, involvement is, isn't, uh, aren't uh, common uh, among patients. And uh, the most uh, common finding is uh, multifocal, bilateral, subparallel ground glass opacities. And uh, we can see it in, uh, among uh, patients in more than 85%. Uh, and finally, I want to conclude that chest CT offers the great sensitivity, sensitivity for detecting COVID-19, especially in the region with severe epidemic situation. But specificity is low for CT scan. Maybe uh, according to the reason that I mentioned before, we underestimate the specificity. But uh, we have to accept that specificity of CT scan is low. But in the context of emergency disease control, it is very, it is very important that chest CT scan provide a fast, convenient, and effective method to every recognized of suspicious cases. But we have to consider the obstacle, to, uh, obstacle of uh, uh, application of CT scan for this patient. For example, as I mentioned before, uh, transmission of the uh, infection, uh, decontamination process, uh, availability of CT scan, and especially cost and ir uh, radiation is very important. But it is a uh, accurate method, uh, accurate screening tool uh, to screen uh, our patient, but we have uh, confirmed the disease by uh, other modalities right, like RT-PCR. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Farhman. Thank you very much, Dr. Farhman, for your detailed explanation. Um, as Dr. Shukuhi told us about how to use point-of-care lung ultrasonography for the diagnosis of COVID-19, uh, it's really interesting that lung sonography can also be used to distinguish between lung and cardiac diseases. It's my, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Human Hossein Nejad. Uh, Dr. Hossein Nejad is the director of point-of-care ultrasound for residents and associate professor uh, of the emergency medicine at TUMS. He's also the author of many published articles and books in the field of emergency medicine. He has held over 20 workshops in this field and is also an ATLS course instructor. Dr. Hossein Nejad, could you please join us? And could you please, Dr. Hossein Nejad? Yes. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Adlani. Do you hear thank me? You. Yes, Dr. Hossein Nejad, I can hear you. Dr. Hossein Nejad, can you please uh, explain about how to distinguish between lung and cardiac diseases using lung sonography? Yes, yes, sure. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Dr. Adlani. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. I share my slides uh, with you. And, uh, uh, I'm going to present role of point of care ultrasound uh, asteriage tool concerning novel coronavirus. Uh, do you see my slides, Dr. Dutton? 
Yes, Dr. Hossein Rajat, I can see your slides. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Uh, as you know, uh, is the, uh, in this pandemic, we face overcrowding and the situation triage and allocate the patients to the best place in best time is very important. For these purposes, we should make decision in three points. First, separation of respiratory patients from other. We consider a space called respiratory emergency, as you see in the picture, uh, called respiratory emergency, and all patients with cough, dyspnea, or other sign and symptoms of respiratory tract refer to it. Second, we should differentiate COVID-19 from non-COVID suspicion patients. When we identify the COVID-19 patients, we should make a decision that they should give inpatient or outpatient service. But uh, what is our toolkit? Uh, apart from uh, history taking, we had very limited test kits that could not help because both efficacy and performance was uncertain. On top of that, uh, we have no time to wait for response. The other option, we can use chest CT scan and uh, evaluate some change and patterns that identified for COVID-19 consists of, uh, you name it, uh, ground glass patches or uh, crazy paving and so on that Dr. Faraman described earlier. But it should be kept in mind that our machines cannot scan all patients because uh, sometimes we have more than 800 patients per day. How can we obtain CT scan of them? In this situation, it was no way to starting ultrasound. According to previous experience, during SARS and MERS, epidemics, it sounds helpful. Lung ultrasound can technically suitable because majority of typical cases reveal peripheral and subpleural lesions. And ultrasound can distinguish the, these lesions, thank God. Also due to high sensitivity, ultrasound can be used as a screen test for a screen test that you know, we, we do not care about a specific. Uh, a screen test, uh, uh, therefore you see several terrier system with uh, aid of ultrasound was developed. Among them, the Italian one that was used by Dr. Uh, Volpicelli is well known that mm, I don't describe it because it will be uh, time consuming. But instead of that, uh, I want to, uh, show the more simple triage system that identified by Dr. Mike Stone and by Butterfly Company support, it is uh, published. As you see in this triage system, three types of patients are enrolled. First, patient with sign and symptoms of respiratory tract, uh, sign and symptom uh, like dyspnea, malaise, cough, so on. Second, patient who come from endemic area and the third, patient who had close contact with confirmed cases. After obtaining sample for PCR, the auto saturation is measured and long ultrasound is performed for them. According to data obtained consists of uh, need to oxygen and finding of long ultrasound, uh, the patient are categorized in four groups. In patient, who supply uh, supplementary O2 is not uh, required. If lung shows a profile, patient can uh, discharge to home, quarantine. Uh, if lung shows B line that Dr. Shukui described well, uh, patient should be discharged uh, to home quarantine plus follow up. Quarantine can be at home or at the institute according to available facilities. But in patient, depending on supplementary ox oxygen, they should be admitted according to the finding of lung ultrasound. If they have only B line, they are admitted in the ward. But if they have profile B plus consolidation, we should consider ICU bed for them. 
as you see, all these systems use long ultrasound uh, for decision making, which works in majority of occasions. But we have critically ill patient with dyspnea and decreased oxygen saturation without proportionate change in lung, uh, even according to CT scan. Some of them patients had underlying disease, or for example, they, are, they were immunosuppressed or were old age. Uh, we can uh, justify the um, uh, acuity of them with the uh, underlying disease or uh, their age. But how about, for example, 22 uh, young men uh, without underlying disease with a minimal change uh, or sometimes no change in CT scan? We could not justify their health status based on the imaging of the respiratory system. What was the origin of the dyspnea in this category of patients? Uh, to discover the cause of dyspnea in these patients, uh, we simply added heart ultrasound to lung ultrasound, observed that young patient uh, who had no proportionate finding in lung imaging, even CT scan, had decreased ejection fracture and global hypokinesia. You can, you can uh, 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 compare upper uh, video with lower, that uh, lower uh, shows the decreased EF. In the meantime, several case series about myocarditis COVID-19 reveal prevalence between 7 to 20%. And uh, increased troponin not at uh, all patients and EKG finding that were non-specific in majority of time confirm myocarditis. This, this help us to calibrate our care for their heart complaints sooner and maybe more effective. In fact, among near 200 patients that our team were scanned, uh, the prevalence was about, uh, I think, 9%. Nine, nine yes. Uh, these are very important patients because they are often young and healthy. And as you know, myocarditis uh, and the rise of troponin is one of the risk factor for fatality. So this approach may provide better prognosis uh, for them. And uh, so we suggest adding heart ultrasound to lung ultrasound as soon as possible. As Dr. Shukri also emphasized, in triage room or in first doctor visit, heart ultrasound, uh, should, I think heart ultrasound necessary even if CT scan is available, because myocarditis with pneumonia can present at the same time. Furthermore, we found that uh, E-point septal separation as a reliable indicator of global hypokinesia uh, can be used effectively instead of eyeballing, because eyeballing needs a high level of expertise and uh, maybe more operator dependent and uh, as you know, obtaining a four chamber view in supine critically ill patient is difficult uh, when the operator lacks expertise. And uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for hearing me. And Dr. Dadlani, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Hossein Najat, for clarifying this topic. Uh, as we now know, uh, focused lung ultrasound can be used to diagnose COVID patients and also how to distinguish it from cardiac diseases. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Mansur Mastridi. Dr. Mastridi received anesthesia board certification from Shiraz University of Medical Sciences and his fellowship in critical care medicine at Shahid Beshti University of Medical Sciences. And he is now currently associate professor and critical care consultant at Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. He's an active researcher and his uh, basic clinical researches are in the field of trauma, lung ultrasonography, and critical care. Dr. Mastridi uh, will introduce a very interesting scenario of a critical patient and how each of these modalities we spoke about today have helped to diagnose and treat this patient. Dr. Mastridi, Dr. Mastridi, can you hear me?
Dr. Masjidi? Um, yes. Good to all. We can't hear you clearly, Dr. Masjidi. Dr. Masjidi, unfortunately, we don't have your voice. Dr. Masjidi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We can see your slides, Dr. Masjidi. Is the learning? Keeps on put Dr. Masjidi, do you hear me? Uh. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't have your voice. Unfortunately, I think we don't have Dr. Mastrudy now. We'll get back to him when he gets connected. Uh, I would like to once again thank everybody for joining us today. I would like to thank our presenters today for updating us on the topic that has been the most discussed topic all over the world and trying to help us to get a step closer to the better management of COVID-19 patients. Uh, today we spoke about uh, chest x-rays, CT scans, point of care, lung ultrasonography, their interpretation, their efficacy, and their use in diagnosing COVID patients. Uh, I would like to also thank Dr. Ziai, Vahid Ziai, the Vice President of Educational Affairs for coordinating and managing today's webinar. And 
I think we have Dr. Master, Dr. Master Di now. We have his slides, but we don't have his voice. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, Dr. Master I can hear you now. I can hear you now. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. Uh, and I apologize for inconvenience. Okay, uh, let's go forward. We are late in time. Uh, sincere gratitude to all doctors, nurses, and healthcare personnel who are risking their lives to assist and cure uh, COVID patients. Um, I strongly believe that uh, case-based learning is uh, so impressive. And I would like to put all that dear professors said together uh, in this case presentation. Let's go forward. A 35-year-old high-risk mother with gestational age at 21 week, gravid four, living two, dead one, brought to hospital due to vaginal bleeding. She is an ER nurse, and she had been at work till two weeks period to admission. Uh, in past medical history, the only significant problem is hypothyroidism and she had been on level thyroid scene. Uh, the diagnosis is placenta accreta and premature rupture of membrane. During two days of hospital stay, period to cesarean section, although she had no sign and symptoms in favor of COVID-19, as a pre-op evaluation in uh, that hospital, Chest CT scan taken reported to be normal. Uh, let's uh, see the uh, chest CT scan. Okay, plan was uh, cesarean section. So proposed operation was cesarean section intraoperatively because of severe hemorrhage and massive transfusion, a uh, total abdominal hysterectomy was done. And uh, postoperatively, she was transferred to ICU. In ICU, blood pressure was 125 over 75, heart rate uh, 150, respiratory rate, she was under controlled mechanical ventilation. A febrile and the saturation by pulse oximetry reads 998. GCS was two with tube. EKG showed sinus tachycardia, ST depression and T wave in inversion in infralateral leads, as you see in this EKG. A chest X ray uh, shows no pathologic finding. So we decided to focus to use POCUS to find the cause of tachycardia and because of the clinical presentation. Part was tachycardic, hyperkinetic, uh, pulmonary artery pressure was mildly elevated. IVC collapsibility, collapsibility was within normal limits, no hypervolemia or, or hypervolemia. Or, uh, was detected. Morrison pouch, splenorenal recess were clear. Suprapubic area shows minimal free fluid. Aorta, femoral, and popliteal vessels shows no abnormal finding. Uh, what about pulmonary? Let me uh, talk about it in the next slide. A few hours later, patient was extubated. No cardiorespiratory complaint, only mild pain, SpO2 reading 96 to 100% with three, three liters of oxygen by nasal cannula, blood pressure 115 over 75, heart rate 130, 
respiratory rate 24 per minute and she was also bright. Uh, uh, as you see, labs data uh, shows significant lymphocytopenia. It persisted in the next uh, uh, blood count. Troponin was seven and again uh, checked within six hours and it was 6.6. .6. Normal level is uh, less than 19. Ion and creatinine with normal limits, AST and ALT and alkaline phosphatase were all normal. LDH uh, has been increased uh, to 590, CPK uh, 428, D-dimer over 2000, CRP 120, and ferritin level was 790 with upper limit uh, of normal uh, 204. Dr. Shukuri, we lost you again. Can you hear me? Dr. Shukuri? Oh, sorry, Dr. Masjidi. I'm sorry. Dr. Masjidi, can you hear me now? Dr. Masjidi, I'm afraid we lost you again. Yes, Dr. Masjidi, can hear you now. Sorry, I think the uh, internet here has uh, some problem. Okay, let's no, okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, can you see my slides? No, not yet, Dr. Masjidi, we can't see your slides yet. Yes, I can see your slides now, Dr. Masjidi. Thank you very much and uh, sorry for inconvenience. Okay, uh, as you see in this uh, slide, uh, these are the findings of uh, ultrasonography on the right side. On the left side, uh, the findings were, were near to uh, the right side. So, as you see, these are the findings in the ultrasonography. And uh, to be interactive, I would like uh, all participants to uh, write their uh, comments on this uh, quiz to be more interactive. Uh, which of the following is less concomitant with COVID-19 pneumonia? A, bilateral symmetrical B-lines, B, subplural consolidation, Apache confluent B-lines, plural effusion, A and B, and B and C. Uh, would you please write your uh, answers in the box at the right lower part of the screen? Because of shortage of time, uh, the answer uh, 
is uh, E. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, patient, because of a patient history, because she was an ER nurse, because of the course of the disease, clinical observation, lab results, uh, and uh, focus findings, and also to rule out uh, uh, pulmonary em uh, embolism. A spiral chest CT with contrast was requested. And uh, done a few hours later after our ultrasonographic evaluation focus. As you see, it was a read, uh, uh, it was read, by uh, five uh, radiologists with uh, mm, uh, good experience, and they are senior uh, radiologists. Uh, mm, there is some inagreement between them uh, from no consistent for COVID-19 uh, to uh, 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 can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Can you hear Yes, doctor, me? Master Shruti, we can hear you. Please go on. Thank you. Uh, so as we see here, there are uh, some agreements between five radiologists reporting the chest CT. Let's see the, uh, see the CT scan. Uh, okay, uh, what uh, has happened as uh, other speakers, dear speakers talk, there should be a correlation between long CT scan and long ultrasound. But uh, why there is some uh, incompatibility between them between the sonar findings and CT scan in our patient. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, write the, um, some differential diagnosis. Why there is some discrepancy between the uh, readings of CT and uh, our findings in uh, ultrasound? Can you write your differential diagnosis? Okay. Uh, first of all, it means it may be a surgical complication. It may, it may be the result of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, transfusion-related acute lung injury, allergic reaction, acute versus chronic infection. It may be uh, uh, because of the pulmonary embolisms, um, maybe amniotic fluid embolism or pulmonary tumor embolism, acute myocarditis, thyroid dysfunction, it may be a presentation of COVID-19 in the early stages and um, maybe primarily a volume overload improved over time. There are uh, multiple uh, articles in the field of COVID and uh, the use of long ultrasound compared with uh, chest CT and uh, one of the latest article comes about uh, uh, three days ago. They summarize that long ultrasonography presents similar accuracy compared to chest CT to detect lung abnormalities in COVID-19 patients. So at conclusion, uh, as you see in this case scenario, long ultrasonography uh, focused in focus in COVID can help early diagnosis, rapid assessment of the severity of disease, can track the evolution of disease in ICU. Uh, we can monitor lung recruitment maneuvers. We can guide response to prone position. Uh, it can help us to manage ECMO and it can help us to during winning uh, procedure. 
uh, chest CT may be reserved for cases where long ultrasonography is not sufficient to answer the clinical question. Uh, RT-PCR is negative, but highly suspicious. These patients uh, may also need chest CT. And uh, at the last, medical imaging is a fast evolving entity, especially in a very new a field such as COVID-19. At the moment, we don't have magic numbers on cut-ups or definite flowcharts. Long ultrasonography uh, in COVID patients is not suitable for naive sonographers. And always integrate different imaging modalities with history, physical exam, labs, and clinical judgment. Uh, very sorry for inconvenience. I'm ready to answer any questions and I should uh, give my thanks to Tehran University of Medical Sciences to prepare this session and also give my great thanks to great speakers for their brilliant talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Masjidi, for your complete explanation. And now it's for our question and answer session. The first question is for Dr. Farah Mand. One of our participants needs to know uh, that why there is a tendency for uh, dilation of vasculature, of vasculature in, the low, in the lower lobes of the lungs and what's the reason behind this tendency? Uh, I uh, thank you very much for this question, but um, I, I'm not uh, really uh, certain about it. But uh, because uh, of the uh, location of the infection is very common in lower lobes, and the uh, inflammation which is produced by uh, after involvement of parenchyma, maybe vasodilation in this area is a sign of this uh, this uh, inflammation in this area. And the vasodilation in the ground glass opacity uh, that is a center for inflammation may be the reason of this uh, finding in CTS scan especially. Thank you very much, Dr. Farahmand. Uh, and I'm very sorry, I should apologize from the other participants because of short of time, we won't be able to answer other questions. And I would once again like to thank you all for joining us. If you have left out anything, don't worry, the recorded webinar will be available shortly. I hope the information we shared today uh, would help you to manage your patients with a better view of the concept. I would also like to thank all health professionals all over the world for staking their health, their safety in the past couple of months, caring for their patients and trying to make this world a better place to live in. Uh, I wish you all a happy COVID-free day. Thank you again for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vasil.